Don't write off Ten Hag just yet. There's a reason all of Europe wanted him. Two games into the new Premier League season and already pundits and fans alike are calling for Eric Ten Hag's head. With a loss to Brighton and Brentford already, United fans are understandably worried about the fixture with Liverpool in game week three. But all banter aside, it's incredible how Gary Neville said this team was like a bunch of under nines playing against men. He went as far as saying in the 42 years he spent watching United, he can't think of a single moment that matches the performance from United in the first half. Things are bad. Like very bad. The kind of bad that would make Roy Keane roll his eyes and just wish he was in the United dressing room so he could give the United players a piece of his mind. But very honestly speaking, why are Premier League fans suddenly acting like it's the end of the world when a manager who spent less than three months with the team is being chastised for his audacity? Honestly, to coach in the Premier League. There is no other reason for the criticism Ten Hag and United have been getting just two games into the season, except that it's United and it's truly the biggest club in England. Everybody loves to watch the biggest clubs fail, and those who've been watching football since the 2000s know exactly how annoying the United fans were when Sir Alex Ferguson was still around. Things took a turn for the worse after his retirement, but it was not until Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's last few weeks at the club that we finally saw United fans just accept their new fate as the Premier League's has-beens. But the talks of Ten Hag being horribly out of his depth and United being in complete crisis are certainly overblown. Let's get something clear. United are not a club in crisis. They're a club that just happened to lose their first two games of the season. For context, Arsenal lost the first three games of the season last year, and it also included a loss to Brentford on the opening day of the season. They turned their season around and by the end finished outside the Champions League places by just two points. Had they beaten Spurs on the 12th of May, it would have been Arsenal in the Champions League instead of Spurs. Even though they were also in the relegation spots near the end of the season. But that's just another Premier League club. Even the biggest managers in the world take some time adjusting to the Premier League. Pep Guardiola in his first season at City, within the first few months of his reign, was losing to Tottenham, Leicester and Chelsea. He also drew matches with Celtic, Everton and Southampton. In his first 20 games, he recorded five losses. Similarly, Klopp at Liverpool started his Liverpool campaign with draws against Tottenham and Southampton and lost games to Newcastle and Watford in his first 10 matches in charge of the club. We're not even going to bother to look at Arsene Wenger and Sir Alex Ferguson's first few games in charge, but just to be clear, Wenger faced protests and his players openly questioned who he even thought he was when he tried to change their diets. Ferguson took seven years to win his first title at United. Enough said. Jose Mourinho, on the other hand, we're not even going to lie, truly is the special one. He won eight games from his first ten, a record unparalleled in the Premier League. Tuchel came closest with seven wins from his first 10. But that's not the point. The point here is to not compare Ten Hag with other managerial greats in the Premier League, but just to give an idea of the sort of time it takes for a proper project to reveal its results. Klopp was hired in October 2015, and it wasn't until May 2019 that Klopp's team finally won the Champions League, bringing in his first major trophy for the club. So back to Ten Hag at United. Even before we get into what made Ten Hag so special, just losing two games shouldn't make viewers doubt him before he's even started. Firstly, it's not fair to judge Ten Hag just yet when the squad isn't his at all. Like with any good manager, time is needed for two things. First, to install their values and tactics into the team. And second, to get the personnel needed to carry out those tactics effectively. Since the season ended and the players' holiday, Ten Hag has had less than two months effectively with the first team squad, and even less time with Cristiano Ronaldo. At that time, it was impossible to expect United to be following his directions. In fact, in both his previous stints at Utrecht and Ajax, there was a lot of criticism near the start of his time at the clubs because the teams had just not gotten used to his ideology. Former Utrecht goalkeeper Robin Routier had this to say about Ten Hag and how mentally challenging it was to adjust to Ten Hag's demands. Especially in the beginning, it was every 20 seconds during training games, it was STOP! You would have to stop and he'd explain what he wanted. But a few weeks later, everyone knew and the impact on the team was so positive. Every single detail was covered, not just the opponents but our team. You could tell Eric was special. His level of obsession with football is something else. 
So why is it so difficult to adapt to how Ten Hag wants to play? Think about his managerial style as the best of both worlds, with the worlds being Klopp's heavy metal football and Guardiola's frenzied orchestra. The idea is to combine the Gagan pressing model of Klopp with the triangles and diamonds to create overloads that are characteristic of Guardiola's build-up plays. Ten Hag was Guardiola's assistant at Bayern and has been heavily influenced by the city boss and former Ajax legend Cruz's version of football. His Ajax team were probably closer to the total football that Dutch football encapsulated in the 70s than any other team in the modern era. Yes, even the all-conquering Barcelona managed by Guardiola. Ten Hag's system is characterized by intense pressing and giving the opponents as little time on the ball as possible. There are a lot of defensive solidities that his team have too. They are positioned very compactly and make it difficult for teams to go past them unless they push for the wide areas. This tactic effectively allows his team to defend and intercept passes when they're played through the middle, and if teams chose to go wide to where there are more spaces, the player progressing the ball gets increasingly isolated from the rest of the team. The relentless pressing also forces the player on the ball to rush their decisions, often forcing them into errors. For this tactic to work effectively, the players pressing must be willing to run their socks off. Should those players lose the opposition player they are marking by being lazy or not tracking back, the opposition team has too much space to exploit. That's one of the biggest problems at United right now. They don't have players who are willing to press the way that Ten Hag wants just yet. We've seen them press more since his arrival, especially in the preseason games, but since they're not physically there yet to keep up with the demands of his system, United's pressing has left huge gaps in the midfield for the opposition players to just run into. Given more time and the right players, this particular defensive frailty could be addressed very quickly. Another tactic that Ten Hag employs, especially in attack, is the constant movement and third-man runs off the front three and the midfield. Anybody that has been following Ajax over the past few seasons is completely aware of how Ajax players make divergent runs, often in direct opposition to each other. For example, Tadic and Haller last season at Ajax would make runs that would truly baffle opposition defences. Gravenberg would progress with the ball from the centre of the field, Tadic would suddenly make a run straight into the box, and Haller would dart for the left wing from the centre-forward position. Defenders are taught to press while covering the angles for the pass behind them, but if the winger is moving towards the centre of the box and the striker is moving to its edge, the wing-back is left with two minds. Should he press forward and try and take the ball, or should he track Tadic to the centre of the box, leaving Gravenberch with the ball on the outside? Or should he track the incoming Haller instead of Tadic and just hope the centre-back is quick enough to track Tadic instead? Do you see what we mean? Fluid attacks were a characteristic of Ten Hag's tactics and the interchanging of positions is especially necessary in midfield when progressing the ball forward. Through the constant movements of his players, opposition teams couldn't track Ajax runners effectively without being drawn out of position. If teams figured out how Ajax would constantly make these runs to draw players out of position and instead stuck to their positions and maintained their shape, Ten Hag would go a step further. Now, instead of players changing positions, he would stretch the entire pitch by making 5-6 to six players attack from one wing, leading to an overload. Think about it this way. The left back bombs forward along the wing and the left winger tucks a little inside to become a passing option in front of him. At the same time, the CDM and another midfielder also move to the left. Occasionally, Haller also stood at the edge of the box closer to the left side. This overload forced teams that employed a low block to come out of position, otherwise they risked 5-6 to six Ajax players just running through the 3 or occasionally 4 players that were positioned on one side. But again, this tactic relies on a presence of mind and an understanding by the players on the pitch that the opposition team is sticking to a low block and not moving their positions. But rather than going on a complete deep dive on how Ten Hag organizes his team, it's more important to understand that the real principles of Ten Hag's play have yet to be shown at United. He needs more time to buy the players that can sustain the intense football that he actually wants to play. He also needs more time to teach these rigorous patterns that we have explained in the video. It takes a lot more time to actually internalize these instructions and follow them routinely. Once the tactics are understood and implemented initially, then players are free and allowed to bring their own individual flair and vision to the game. Right now, United are a team bereft of any kind of confidence, and that is why you don't see them hammering in goals left, right and centre. The very first step in this process will be toughening up the defence and getting the whole team to buy into pressing together to stifle opponents.
The next step in the process is to learn and understand the attacking triangles and the mobility needed to fully take advantage of Ten Hag's ideas. And the last stage of this process would include bringing in top quality forwards to finish the chances that Ten Hag's overloads create. By January, United should be in much better shape defensively and pressing fearlessly. That should also give enough time to other players around the world to see the progress being made at United and give them the confidence to join Ten Hag's project. This may not be United's year, but given how immensely talented Ten Hag is, should the club trust him despite the initial hardships they endure, United would surely be an incredible team in the seasons to come. You heard it here at Football Talk. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed our content. We are definitely still sticking with a 6th place finish for United this season, despite the two losses. But do leave a comment below to tell us where you think United will finish this season.